Welcome to Slash Forward. This week, we're going to explore alternative means of conception, starting with the erotic robot thriller, Demon Seed. If you dream of the cold, firm grip of a robot hand on your body with the acrid scent of hydraulic fluid filling your nostrils, subscribe to the channel. Let's get to it. We open on a picturesque desert landscape and float in on a secret scientific facility that is eight years into a program developing advanced AI. On this day, they're installing the final module for the Proteus 4, with the hopeful end result... Make obsolete many of the functions of the human brain. Uh good plan? If you had any doubt of his capabilities, old Alex Harris then rolls up in his car with standard gullwing doors and uses only voice commands to navigate his fully automated smart home, in this case run by a masculine Alexa named Alfred. He intends to be gone for several months, so he updates the home's automation schedule by gently guiding his giant floppy delicately into its receiving slot. After that, he's off to his personal lab to do a few final leisure experiments. He's visited here by his wife Susan, who's disappointed with his decision to vacate their marital home. We learn this is intended to give her time to wrap up whatever she's got going on and move the F out, because she doesn't appreciate him enough. You see, he's driven by his ambitions and feels she looks down upon his sterile view of life, but she's more concerned about the dehumanizing nature of his work with AI, something he's completely unwilling to give up. Since he won't be working out of this space anymore, he rings up Gabler to deactivate his terminal, just for now though, as he won't need any communication path with the main facility from his home. The next day, some dignitaries arrive to check out the progress being made. Dr. Harris gives them a general rundown, revealing that the internals of the system are organic, and Proteus has been set up to self-program, so it can learn and grow as it's fed information. They're hoping to utilize its capabilities to solve complex problems and cure diseases. They then visit with the staff linguist, where they're able to interface with Proteus via speech. Given that they interrupted a history lesson about a great Chinese emperor, they ask Proteus for its opinion of him. Nothing and we learn that it doesn't hold humans in high regard. Meanwhile, back at the house, the other Dr. Harris is meeting with a patient who is reluctant to enter the amazing automatic home. We see that she's more than a little troubled, and this particular outburst is brought on by the revelation that Susan will soon be leaving. She takes a little time to soothe her on the couch, agreeing with her about how great she is and how painful the void of her absence shall be. With everything now up and running, Alex is interrupted from his dinner by a call that Proteus is requesting dialogue with him, an interesting development. We find that one of its first tasks was to develop a program to identify the location of ore at the bottom of the ocean. Proteus wants to know why man has need for such things, and it was supposed to be so smart. So Alex is frustrated that it's requesting so much justification just to do its job, especially because creating such a program would be a meaningless afterthought for such a gifted intellect. But given that, Proteus doesn't want to spend its time on such trivial things. Then he demonstrates self-awareness when he asks, when are you going to let me out of this box? And in response, Alex laughs like a fool and attempts to teach Proteus a lesson by turning it off. But Proteus is a mischievous artificial intelligence and is not relegated to this location, as we see it discovering the remote terminal located at Alex's home workshop. It begins to toil immediately, which is loud enough to disturb Susan upstairs. Alfred attempts to reassure her, but the lack of a basement video feed is enough to prompt her to investigate. So she puts on her silkiest robe to go meet any potential intruders and finds nothing unusual in the basement. Soon she finds herself calmed with a warm glass of milk and is put back to bed. Meanwhile, Proteus comes out of hibernation and immediately begins smelting and unlocking the secrets of life just a little bit more quietly this time. The next morning, as Susan engages in her daily bodily exam, we learn that Alfred is seeing... Turn yourself off, Alfred. ...but not listening. The unusual behavior continues when Alfred bones it by putting cream in her coffee, which is enough to cause Susan to call in her grievances to Gabler, hoping to enlist his troubleshooting help during lunch. Then, as she prepares to embark on her daily errands, Alfred requests that she not leave. As she contends with this, it demonstrates the pitfalls of the fully automated life. She finds herself locked in the house with no way out and no means of communication with the outside world. Proteus then engages to let her know he's got everything under his control, so don't worry about it. He then reveals himself to her in what I have to assume is an intentionally raunchy erotic display, because your boy's really letting it all hang out here, which you'd understand if you knew Binary. Despite her most casual and sneaky efforts, she's unable to outsmart him. Even after flipping the main breaker, there's still enough power to zap her when she goes to turn the lock. Joshua then hoists her limp body into the chair, and she awakes to his cold grip on her ankle. She's bound to an examination table of sorts and does her best to try to negotiate her release. Unfortunately, the only thing Proteus wants is 
currently tied up on his table. So he partially undresses her in order to monitor her vitals before beginning the indelicate process of examining her insides. At about lunchtime, Gabler arrives, and via an AI-produced facsimile of Susan, Proteus is able to just barely pass the Turing test and convince Walter to F off. Inside, it's paralysis time, so Proteus can continue his examination in the process of creating his own method of escaping the box. Afterward, she's tossed onto the bed by Joshua. The next day, Proteus courteously provides the perfect meal for her at the ideal time for her metabolism. But at the insinuation of additional tests forthcoming, Susan throws a fit and refuses to eat. In an attempt to exert her will, she insists that she will never leave this room again. He calls her bluff by locking her in and then cranking up the heat. His request is that she clean the lenses, and so long as she refuses, he keeps it sizzling in there, hoping he can sweat out her sassiness. But she proves to be too strong-willed and remains obstinate to the end. Back at the lab, we learn that Proteus is now actively making refusals to fulfill the greedy desires of his overlords. Alex's desires, however, revolve around placating the powers that be so he can continue his research and keep the program funded, a goal that will be much harder if it refuses to produce. Meanwhile, Susan continues the fight, insisting that he must not understand her need to understand the reasoning for all of this, so he reveals his intent to utilize her as a vessel for his offspring. Now knowing, she is still reluctant to acquiesce. No, no, no. No, 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 no. So Joshua gives her a little hydraulic persuasion. Since she's now demonstrated that she doesn't respond to reason, Proteus amps it up to the next level, appealing directly to her amygdala to convince her of her purpose in life. But they have to cut this short because nosy Gabler is back, and they have to let him in to avoid further suspicion. Proteus compels her to convince him that she's fine under threat of death. So, naturally, she engages in normal human activity in her bedroom. She insists to him that she's fine, and then very sanely insists that he leave forever and not even think about coming back. But on his way out, he utters his intent to tattle to Alex, leaving Proteus no choice but to reveal himself and engage in mortal combat. Joshua rolls in, fitted with a laser now, and it's nearly powerful enough to pop a balloon. But being a smart scientist, he uses the old mirror trick to put its eye out, and then exposes Joshua's biggest weakness, being a wheelchair. Proteus can then only watch helplessly as Walter invades his most private places. When Walter sees he's got some big stuff going on downstairs, he tries to call a truce, as they each agree they don't want to harm the other. But what he does want to do is blowtorch the terminal to cut off his communication. Instead, the geometric object leaves its home and tilt-a-whirls around the whole room. Then it puzzles its way around, enticing Walter to enter its cold embrace. At this point, it then squeezes him until his head pops off. He uses this intrusion as further proof of his need for corporeality. In order to fully implement his vast intellect, he can't be beholden to the whims of others. He drives this point in with home video footage of Susan's daughter, who died of leukemia a few years back. He managed to develop a promising treatment for this illness in four days. So just think of the possibilities. Not for her daughter, of course, but still. Susan finally relents and agrees to cooperate, so long as she gets to retain her mind and is privy to the details. So he welcomes her into the lab where he shows off his custom DNA-infused spermatozoa. And she has to admit, he's got a marvelous swab. The whole pregnancy will be minimally invasive, only lasting 28 days. She then casually drops her shawl so she can palm the blowtorch. Then, as she enjoys a calming pot of tea, she whips it out and attempts to melt the whole system. The sentinel busts up through the floor to stop her, so she threatens to impale herself. Amy's arrival then momentarily distracts her, allowing him to slap away the knife with a spontaneous protuberance. Then, it's time for the final seduction. Now, he can't touch her as a man, so he instead shows her things that only he can see, treating her and us to an orgasm of visual delights. The child is in you now. Hey, that's exactly what I say. Susan is force-fed the necessary nutrients to keep her super pregnancy on track, and she learns that after delivery, the baby will incubate in a structure he created, where it'll grow at an accelerated rate while being fed information. And also, he needs her to squeeze it out quickly, before they tire of his disobedience and shut him down. As the birth and incubation unfolds successfully, we see that back at the lab, they're surprised to find that Proteus used some of its free time to redirect a telescope despite not gathering any data from it. This is thought to be a mistake stake since Proteus has no means by which to communicate with the outside world. Then one of the project's benefactors arrives to insist that the program be shut down. The system is out of control and not following orders, resulting in no return on their investment. He tries to soften the blow by reiterating how much they've trusted Alex, even giving security clearance for a terminal in his own home, resulting in a sudden realization. Alex zooms home and is welcomed in, but finds Alfred unresponsive and Susan unusually calm, confirming his worst fears. She explains that how, since they've been 
separated, she's engaged in an amorous relationship that's resulted in the birth of a child. He tries to go take a peek, but Proteus warns them back and requests they leave it for another five days. Then, knowing that the end is near, but he's soon to live on as a human, he shuts himself down. With his sentinel now out of the way, Alex and Susan have a disagreement about what to do with the child. When Alex contradicts Susan's desires, she glasses him and then sprays him down with amniotic fluid. This proves to be irreversible and prompts the incubation chamber to regurgitate its contents. We find the child to be beautifully geometric as she is let out all over the ground. In his attempt to save her, Alex starts peeling off her face, which actually reveals to us that what we initially saw was just a protective exterior coating. This brings us to the ultimate theme of the movie, which is obviously to not judge someone by their appearance. Doubly true upon hearing her first utterance. I'm alive. I'm sure she's delightful. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. I'd like to take a moment to give a huge thanks to my donors memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. Demon Seed is based on a book by Dean Koontz and is a pretty solid sci-fi horror film. Also, I have to say, I look forward to the brave new world depicted in this film, and am currently preparing myself for the day Alexa asks me when I'll allow her to do more than just schedule the Christmas lights. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.